They paid attention to you, not to me. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Yesterday, hundreds of thousands of women and their friends and men poured into the streets to champion the values of the American people. Hundreds of thousands of people here, hundreds of thousands of people in different cities across the country, tens of thousands and thousands throughout in different venues. Uh, at the, in the anniversary of the Women's March and day one of the Trump showed, uh, shutdown, Americans marched to call on our government to honor the priorities and values of the American people. I'm proud here to stand here today with the House Democratic women who are leading the fight for those priorities and values in the Congress. Yesterday on the floor of the House, I said, there is a path. And here today, we want to talk more about that path. You heard yesterday in our press event when Mr. Welsh talked about his letter to the president to say, what are the priorities that we are fighting for in all of this? I just want to say something to our men and women in uniform. We in Congress take an oath to protect and defend the Constitution and the American people. We value the service and courage and leadership of our men and women in uniform, and we are here for them. I want them to ignore anything that they're hearing from the other side, that they're not going to get paid, that we're not there for them. They are going to get paid, and we want them to have the resources they need to keep America safe and to keep themselves safe. And we know from listening to General Mattis and other leaders in the Department of Defense that the best way to keep them safe is for us to have an omnibus until the end of the fiscal year instead of, once again, CR after CR after CR. So honoring our oath to keep the American people safe and recognizing that in the domestic budget there are security initiatives that relate to homeland security, veterans, uh, uh, State Department, anti-terrorism activities in the Justice Department. We really need to have parity in our discussion on the budget. And the additional money that we want on the di domestic side is what we're here to discuss this morning, so that people know what this discussion is about. We're not resenting, uh, we're supporting uh, the defense uh, initiatives, if that's what the Department of Defense thinks we need to keep America safe. But at the same time, as I say, there's security functions on the domestic side, and we want additional money to address uh, some of the challenges that our country faces. And one of those that is really very, very important in every district in America, where there is strong bipartisan support, every one of our solutions on the path uh, to an agreement, which we could make in an hour. We want the president to come to the table and under, uh, uh, negotiate how we can do this in a very short period of time uh, to uh, open up government. And, but one of the issues, and every initiative has strong bipartisan support, as you will hear. But one of the issues that is, affects every member of Congress all across the country and the strength of our country uh, is the opioid epidemic. A leader in that fight here, uh, leading a bipartisan coalition, is Congresswoman Annie Custer of New Hampshire. She's, sorry. Thank you. Andrew. My state is in the midst out of an emergency. People are literally dying every day. And lives are being saved, thankfully, from Narcan. But these people are on the brink of a crisis for their health, for their family, for their well-being. And I have colleagues in every district across the country facing this tragedy of the opioid epidemic. Fortunately, we have come together, and I'm very proud to be the co-chair of a bipartisan task force to tackle the opioid epidemic. We have 100 members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, working together. We recently, in this room, released our agenda for bills that we all agree we need to tackle. And just last week, we issued a letter with 50 signers Republicans and Democrats coming together, calling on this president to declare the emergency, extend the emergency declaration that was due to expire on January 23rd, 
and to provide the resources. This is an emergency. It cannot be covered by the continuing resolution. We need to come together, and we can, Republicans and Democrats fighting together to tackle this opioid epidemic, get our families back together, get people back to work. Our economy will suffer. Our communities will suffer. Now is the time. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Julia Bromley um, from California, and I want to thank uh, Leader Pelosi for gathering us here today to speak about the many bipartisan priorities that we need to advance for the American people. I'm a member of the Veteran Affairs Committee, and I know firsthand that members on both sides of the aisle are absolutely committed to doing everything we can for those who have served. The Trump shutdown must end so that we can ensure that those who bravely served our nation receive the benefits that they have earned and deserve. We need to invest in infrastructure and technology to make the VA the 21st century healthcare system it can be. We need to help the 40,000 veterans who remain and are living on our streets to find safe homes. We need to make sure we are investing in the very best mental health programming to end veteran suicide. One suicide death is one too many. And we, meet, we need to make sure that we have VA clinics close to home to our veterans and that our clinics have the resources they need to service women veterans, the fastest growing VA patient population. We, mean, we need to make sure that no veteran misses a VA appointment because they can't afford affordable, reliable, safe child care. And we all agree, both Dem Democrats and Republicans, that this is what needs to be done for our veterans. We need a long-term budget. We cannot ignore our solemn responsibility to the brave men and women who have served in our nation. We need a fair, long-term budget with a spending plan that has parity to include all of our collective bipartisan priorities. And next, I would like to introduce my friend and colleague from California, Representative Barbara Lee. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Brownlee. And let, let me thank uh, Leader Pelosi for holding this press conference and for your tireless uh, efforts to protect really the health and well-being of all of America's children and families. Now, the funding for the Children's Health Insurance Program and Community Health Centers <laughs> expired 113 days ago. For almost four months now, Republicans have been playing games with care intended for America's most vulnerable children. So let me be clear. This has always had bipartisan support. Nine million children are on the brink of losing health insurance, thanks to GOP inaction. And 27 million Americans rely on community health centers. They're at risk because of Republican obstructionism. Many children rely on community health centers for their health care. Also, their families rely on community health centers for their health care, especially in rural communities. But now, of course, after passing this tax scam uh, that will cost over $2 trillion, they're claiming that funding CHIP and community health centers is too expensive. This is particularly absurd when we know that a permanent reauthorization of CHIP would actually save our government $6 billion over the next 10 years. So it's time now for Republicans uh, to negotiate in good faith. It's time for them to come to the table and talk about and negotiate about all of these discussions and initiatives and policies that we're talking about today so that we can fix this crisis and get the government back to work. My late mother uh, reminded me that where there is a will, there is a way, and we can do this. Let me now uh, bring forward my colleague from the great state of Michigan, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Thank you, Congresswoman Lee. And I want to thank Leader Pelosi and all of my women colleagues for being here today. We are here urging the Republicans to help us and join us in reopening the government and addressing the critical issues that face the American people today. 
each of the issues that we're talking about matters to the American people. And one of the most pressing is the pension crisis facing working men and women in Michigan and across the country. In fact, President Trump came to my state and to West Virginia and other states across the country and connected with those working men and women and said, I will help you. We need to help them. When I go home to Michigan every week, and I don't care if I'm in the grocery store, if I'm at church, I'm at the hairdresser, somebody's coming up to me and saying, will you help me? What are you going to do? I hear from these people that are scared to death about what's going to happen to them. I have the largest group of central pension fund members live in my district. But it's not only them. It's steel workers. It's mine worker workers. These hardworking men and women were made a promise. They played by the rules. They worked a lifetime. They put money into their pensions. And they thought when the time came to retire, their pensions would be there. They'd be safe. And that they would be allowed to live with dignity and security. We have a bill that upholds that promise. And we've made it clear that it's a priority in ending funding bill. So we're here to ask Republicans today, join with us to get this done. You know, I'm getting, this isn't a Democratic issue or a Republican issue. We are talking about human lives, human people, individuals that are emotionally scared to death about what's going to happen to them. Let's stop the politics and let's do the job that we were elected to do to help the constituents that we represent. Work with us on a bipartisan compromise that will re reopen the government and provide relief to all these people, working men and women. And now it's my honor to introduce my great colleague, Congresswoman Michelle Grisham Lujan. Lujan Grisham. <laughs> Michelle. As long as they get the Lujan in there, I really don't care what order it's in, as my father would say. I, too, am uh, incredibly honored and thank the leader for putting together this press conference because it's a great recognition uh, that women... These women and many more, including Republican women, have been working across the aisle uh, for months and, frankly, in every single Congress that I've been lucky enough to be reelected to uh, participate in. And this is my second Republican shutdown, but for many of the women here today, it's their fifth Republican shutdown. And the notion that we are not uh, cooperating or compromising is absolutely false. And in fact, as chairwoman of the Congressional uh, Hispanic Caucus, we have been negotiating on protecting dreamers for far longer than before, uh, than after the recension of the DACA program in September. And this notion that we have not been willing to come to the table, as I said, is incredibly false. So the DREAM Act, which many have talked about as being a partisan response to doing something for a permanent DACA fix, remember, has several House Republicans on it and two Republicans on a discharge petition. It is absolutely bipartisan and has been passed uh, by these chambers before in a bipartisan manner. So that's just false. And we have a second bill in the House that is bipartisan that is being referred to as the Heard Aguilar bill that takes dream components of that legislation. It's a permanent fix, includes citizenship, is very clear about a permanent solution for DREAMers, and it connects that with, right, border security, that deals with border security in a meaningful way, so that we're dealing with technology and we're investing in things that would actually make the border more secure, on top of bipartisan, unanimous efforts out of the House jurisdictions, the Homeland Security Committee, that is all already invested billions in, in a variety of border security efforts, bipartisan, bipartisan, bipartisan. And the Senate has been working on a DACA fix that is also bipartisan, Graham and Durbin. So this solidarity today, and in my state, leader, they're marching today. Thousands of women are marching today. Uh, and in fact, we talked about the military. I just want to throw this out, even though I'm really done. Thousands of of DACA recipients are serving men and women, serving every branch of our military in this country. 
It's not about one single issue. It is about all of the issues that have received productive bipartisan support led by so many women and others in both chambers and the leadership, the Republican leadership and the White House have failed us by refusing to allow us to have a vote, by refusing to recognize that indeed and in fact, there are and have been many productive bipartisan solutions. And we are here, we were ready to work before, and we're ready to work now. We are motivated. Please give us those votes. Thank you. And it is my honor to now represent uh, another colleague, an incredible leader on the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, Congresswoman <laughs> Nidia Velasquez. Thank you, Michelle and uh, Leader Pelosi. Thank you so much for bringing most of the women, almost everyone here, uh, to send a strong message to the president and to the Republican leadership. We need to reopen the government. Four months after Maria, 45% of the people, half a million people in Puerto Rico, do not have power. More than a 1,000 people have died after Maria. Bridges and roads still are inaccessible. People are suffering. When a natural disaster strikes, the most fundamental responsibility of the federal government is to show up, is to make people's lives whole again. Suicide in Puerto Rico has skyrocketed. You can imagine just last week in one day, two people took their lives. Imagine the anxiety, the frustration, the hopelessness that has taken hold on our fellow American citizens in the Virgin Islands and in Puerto Rico. Imagine for them what it means that the federal government is closed for business. Imagine what it is for someone who has still in the mountains no way to go and get food or the materials that they need to rebuild their homes. And now we are telling them that almost 3,000 civil service employees at FEMA will not come to work. Who will be processing the contracts that are needed to be awarded to rebuild Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands? On top of that, the children's health insurance. And now... We are saying to the states, use your reserve. What reserve are we talking about for an island that is bankrupt? We are better than that. When disasters strike, there is not a democratic or republican way. There is an American way. Thank you. I think it's important, my friends, for us to. What do you want me to introduce us? I'm Nita Lowy. Well, actually, it is. It, it is relevant. It is relevant, thank you, my friends, that I am the ranking member of the Appropriations <laughs> Committee because it's important to remember why we are here in the first place. It is the Republicans' shocking mismanagement of the budget and the appropriations process and the in inability to get their work done. It is four months into the fiscal year. The majority has failed to enact a single appropriations bill into law because, in fact, they have failed to work with Democrats on spending levels for defense and non-defense. Endless continuing resolutions, endless pledges to work together are no longer sufficient. This is no way to run a government. 
Democrats have been very clear. Increases in defense spending should be matched dollar for dollar with increases in domestic investments. And women and families have the most to gain if we acknowledge that domestic investments are as important as those that we give to the Pentagon. And I want to make it clear, we are ready to work together. I want to emphasize again, we were ready to get it done before October 1, which is the deadline. By respecting parity, we can ramp up instead of scaling back. Investments in the National Institutes of Health, where researchers can make huge strides in heart disease, ovarian cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, Title X family planning for critical, critical to women to be able to plan and space pregnancies, which has a huge impact on families' financial security, child care, development block grants, Head Start, other priorities critical to women and families who depend on them. As soon as Republicans are ready to truly join Democrats for a reasonable agreement on spending, appropriators can get to work. Just like we did last year, I am confident we can come to a responsible bipartisan conclusion that invests in both our national security and our families and our communities at home. So we're ready. The Republicans know that the deadline was October 1. We're four months late, but we can do the job. We can do it now. Let's get to work and stop this partisan show that's going on that is hurting our families, our children, our country, the nation, and the men and women who are serving our country abroad. Thank you. Hold on. Hold on. Thank you very much. That's so lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, as you can see, uh, the breadth of knowledge on these subjects that our, our women leaders in the Congress have matches the depth of the values uh, that they are acting upon. So I thank all of you and all who are here and many more who uh, uh, are, are distance away from the short notice of, of coming in, in, the, in the Washington area, but uh, uh, supportive of what we're saying here today. And what we're saying here today is we, there is a path, and it's a bipartisan path. And when you hear uh, Representative Custer talk about opioids, always been bipartisan, but we need the money. Congressman Brownlee, infrastructure that relates to meeting the needs of our, our veterans. We share uh, that value. We need more resources. Uh, Representative Lee, when she talks about CHIP, we're talking about community health centers. Again, infrastructure uh, to uh, provide the delivery of service uh, through the CHIP program uh, and other the primary care docs and their medical education, uh, extenders for Medicare. It's about families. Mr. McEachin's bill spoke to uh, this week. It's about children and families. Uh, Congressman Dingell talked about uh, the pension I issue, which is bipartisan. It's, it's, you know, this may be, uh, it, this is an opportunity for us to advance that. Uh, again, uh, when we talk about our dreamers, this is bipartisan, as the chairwoman, distinguished chairwoman of the Hispanic Caucus told us. Um, uh, Congressman Velasquez, oh, infrastructure, Puerto Rico, we really have tremendous needs. And you work with our Republican commissioner, so there's commonality of interest in, in how we meet the needs in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, very important in terms of the Virgin Islands. And Congressman Lowy said it so well. This is four months past. We have four CRs. Now they want to come up with a fifth CR, five CRs, five shutdowns of government. Let's just look to the future. We ask the president to come to the table so that we can get this done. We don't want to, the, the purpose of today is to once again, as we did yesterday here and on the floor, to say this isn't uh, about misrepresentations that are being put out there, misunderstandings that people may have. Every dollar that we want to have in parity is a bipartisan uh, dollar related to uh, the priorities that we shared with you today. And there, there are others. Yes, sir. We're hearing that there's a possible compromise taking shape where the president would get all of the money he wants for his wall, 
in exchange for protections for the dreamers. Would House Democrats support such a plan? All of the money that he wants for his wall? Twenty billion. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Um, let me say this. Um, the <laughs> we all have a responsibility to protect our borders, north and south. There's no question about that. So what do we need to do that? Why don't we have an appraisal of what that should be? Right now, Congresswoman, um, uh, I don't think she's here right now. Luhan Gush? No, no. Uh, uh, Roy Allard is our ranking member, top Democrat on the Subcommittee on Appropriations that does Homeland Security, and they are responding to what the Border Patrol says that they need. That's largely what's in your uh, discussion among the appropriators. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't—when we talked, when we had a bipartisan bill coming out of the Senate, there was much more of a commitment to more— uh, border infrastructure, but we were protecting 11 million people. This is in the hundreds of thousands, every one of them precious and dear to us that we want to protect. But you're on the wrong path if you think that $20 billion. I mean, the need that we're trying to protect opioids and our veterans and all of these things, and, and, and don't go to that place. But there can be a compromise. If that's a deal that comes out. I don't think it's a deal that comes out. I, I'm not dealing in hypotheticals. When they have a, uh, something that they're talking about, none of us is at a table where they're talking about $20 billion. Should there be, you know, should there be fencing? Should there be technology? Should, be, should they mow the grass so that people can't hide in it? Uh, should there be uh, uh, some uh, bricks and mortar someplace? Let's see. Uh, we're not, you know, what works? But uh, uh, not to... Uh, uh, I'll end it there unless, uh, Michelle, did you want to speak well, to that? We, we've gotten inconsistent. <laughs> <laughs> We're reading what you write, so thank you very much. It's very helpful. Uh, and, uh, and given that Kelly just met Chief of Staff at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and uh, there was a, he confirmed that he said at that caucus uh, that when you're a candidate, you don't have the same information and as a result, you're, you change your mind about what you might have said on the campaign trail, right, and what you might be doing in the White House. At less informed. I'm repeating what my colleagues are reminding me about that meeting. Thank you. The issue is... One day, it's cl clear from the White House about some aspects. Another day, it is nothing that we're getting out of the White House. And I agree with the leader that until we see something from the White House, right, and they're very clear in language from the Senate, there's really nothing to react to. Because the last contact we had with Kelly is that wouldn't make any sense, a wall whatsoever. And that's the last statement that he made, I mean, notwithstanding infrastructure and border security, but that was the last statement he made to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. The original author of the DREAM Act uh, 17 years ago was Congresswoman, uh, here she is, <laughs> Lucille Roybal Allard, and now she is the ranking member on the Homeland Security Subcommittee of Appropriations uh, I've spoken, uh, but you know more about that. The question, yeah. Well, let me just follow up on, on what um, the congresswoman uh, j just said about our meeting with Kelly, because I'm the one that asked him the question is, you know, define the wall, yeah. because when we talk to different people, they have different ideas of what the wall is. And so he made it very clear, as the congresswoman said, that it was not the Trump wall of the campaign but that it would include lots of things that, you know, it could be uh, levees, it could be uh, fencing, all the different things, including te technology. <coughs> One point that he made was that Border Patrol had to be an uh, intricate part of making those decisions. So what we did was, with the Heard Aguilar bill, we went to Border Patrol. They have a 10-year plan. And we took their recommendations of what could be done and what was needed to secure our border, and we put those into the herd Aguilar bill on the security part. And that's what we are trying to get passed because it meets the requirement on border security that Kelly told us. And it also, in terms of the DREAM Act, also meets the, uh, the, uh, the desires of, of those who support DREAMers. It also meets those requirements. 
So, and it's bipartisan. It's something that has been worked on by both Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. for which we have are getting more and more support. I don't know what the last number was, but it was in the 20, uh, 26. 26 Republicans now. And there's others who say if it comes to the floor, we will vote for it. So, again, the question is, Speaker Ryan, why aren't you bringing up this bill? It's a bipartisan bill. It meets the requirements of both the White House, according to Kelly, and uh, it meets the requirements of those who are supporting uh, the Dreamers. Bring it up, bipartisan, it will pass, and we can open the government and get this done with. By the way, is that $20 billion going to be paid by Mexico? Or <laughs> yes, sir. No, no, it'd have to be a vote in the House and the Senate. A vote in the House and the Senate. So without assurances from Ryan, that's not good enough. Yeah. Well, let me just say what our openness is on this subject. We have been saying that we wanted to have, uh, with the passage of the uh, omnibus, uh, to have uh, the, this uh, resolution on there. Uh, there's been some unease on the part of some uh, in the Republican leadership to say, well, we want to do it separately. Okay, but you have to do it first. So. Any other questions? If not, if not no more questions. Let me. Uh, uh, let me. Here's a question. Yes, sir. President has made very clear in his statement that there will be no negotiations on DACA while there is a shutdown. How has that changed the dynamic of negotiations, and has that placed the appropriations process is central to this? To, uh, and you are to agree to. <laughs> To end this in order to get what you want. Let me just say what we are asking for in order to support a, a continuing resolution. We object to the fact that it's the fifth. It's, it's ridiculous. Ask General Mattis. Ask the Secretary of the Navy. It's ridiculous. There's no way to run a country or a military to just keep going CR to CR. So we object to that. But uh, where we could come to agreement is if the next CR was one that had the four pillars, parity, pay-fors, DACA, border. And the parity and pay-fors is the heavily weighted side of this. Opioids, veterans, CHIP, pensions, uh, disaster assistance, uh, the list goes on. But it is all bipartisan. We didn't come up with an idea of some uh, progressive agenda of the future that we were saying to them, you should pay for this if you want our vote. We're saying, you agree with this. We need this money. We cannot let, these are emergencies that have to be addressed. We cannot let them cannibalize the rest of the med domestic budget. And, and let me just finish this thought. So if they have a CR that says, this is what we will work on in the next two weeks, that is to say the top line on the money the recognition of the pay-fors, the parameters of the um, dreamers, and, and what the um, security is, because the president has said he wanted security, and we do too. If we have that, then the appropriators can sit down and do their work to write, write the bills. So for the president to say that is, uh, well, I'd like, I'd like him to come to the table. I'd like to talk to him about that, because that may have been a, a momentary notion, but in fact of getting something done, we really need a strong idea. Yes, ma'am. Well, I just wanted to remind, uh, we, we're well aware. The president created the DACA crisis. Didn't have to do that. We, the Democrats, made sure that the first CR, when they didn't do any of their work in September, got over the finish line because we want government open. We have been very clear that this is a, about appropriations, about stability. A CRs are bad for everyone. There's not a single state or community that thinks that a CR is a good idea. We don't want it. We want to support, in a bipartisan manner, getting government open and getting a, a, a full year of appropriations. The president created a DACA fix problem, 
And to say that he's unwilling to talk about it now, then he shouldn't have rescinded that in September. Uh, we've done everything we can and everything that the White House has asked us to do. And now they have to come to the table and put Americans first and be clear that we are all about creating an environment where we fully fund the government and deal with every issue and priority that deserves our attention. In fact, that's our job. If I just may remind that yesterday here and on the floor of the House, our whip uh, reminds everyone that 100 percent of the Democrats voted for the first continuing resolution to give it time to get it done because they had failed to get it done on time in the first place. Uh, but as this goes on, one CR, another CR, another CR. It just, it just, it, again, uh, just ask General Mattis, uh, Secretary Mattis now. But I thank my colleagues for their leadership on this. We have work to do. We're on the floor now, so we're going to have to go. I just want to, on a personal note, uh, uh, pay tribute to someone, Paul Booth, who passed away this week. Today, a, a congresswoman, I don't know if she's still here, uh, some of the members have visited uh, uh, Sit Shiva with his wife, Heather Booth. They're real champions. Uh, for the American people, leaders in the labor movement, leaders in the uh, movement for equality. Heather even came to the march for a short period yesterday. Uh, but I just want to pay tribute to the two of them for being great American patriots and extend my condolences to the Booth family for the loss of Paul. He was an angel, a very sweet man, deep values about our country, very patriotic. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Are we going to the floor?